These are the headlines that we're following at this hour. Humbly accepting the people's choice in the general election last week, President Yoon song yeol apologizes for the failure to reflect the needs of Korean citizens and vows to listen carefully to the public. Japan has once again renewed false claims on South Korea's easternmost Dokdo Island. This is in its annual foreign policy report where it also disputed a South Korean Supreme Court ruling over compensating victims of wartime forced labor. Today marks 10 years since the Sewer Ferry sinking, one of South Korea's most painful maritime disasters that took the lives of 304 people, mostly school children. With yellow ribbons tied by mourners, take a look at how the victims are remembered. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We start with President Yoon song yeols live address on the outcome of the April 10th election. He expressed his regret over not being able to recognize and reflect what people want, while also vowing to carefully listen to the public going forward. Our correspondent Woo Su-young leads us off. President Yoon suk yeol has apologized for his failure to communicate and reflect the needs of Korean citizens, humbly accepting their choice to vote in an opposition majority into parliament. This came at Tuesday's cabinet meeting, where the South Korean leader conveyed his position on the outcome of last week's general election, which saw a crushing defeat for Yoon's ruling People Power Party, casting a shadow over the next three years of his presidency. Yoon said he had focused on making systematic improvements to the Korean economy, but in the grand scheme of things, the administration had failed to deliver tangible improvements to people's livelihoods. 결국 아무리 국정의 방향이 옳고 좋은 정책을 수없이 추진한다 해도 국민들께서 실제 변화를 느끼지 못한다면 정부의 역할을 다하지 못한 것입니다. 국민께서 바라시는 변화가 무엇인지. 어떤 것이 국민과 나라를 위한 길인지 더 깊이 고민하고 살피겠습니다. To this end, Yoon plans to continue a series of policy forums around the nation, which invite local citizens to discuss issues affecting their livelihoods. Yoon also vowed to move ahead with his three major reforms for education, labor and pensions to overcome fundamental barriers to future economic growth, as well as push for medical reform. More crucially, the president pledged to become more humble and flexible in his communication and listen carefully to the voices of the people in recognition of their diverse needs. A senior aide to Yun added that the president in his closing remarks said he was sorry for failing to reflect upon public opinion and that he had been the first to fail to communicate. Yun's office has been seen as lacking in public engagement and uncompromising in pushing through policies without sufficient discourse. Also leading up to the election, the controversy surrounding Yoon's Secretary for Social Affairs and his ambassador to Australia had further dampened public opinion. With Yoon having promised a reform of how his administration runs state affairs, the president is expected to replace his most senior officials, including his chief of staff and the prime minister, who offered to resign last Thursday. Yoon Zay told reporters that given the enormity of these positions, the new appointments will take time, indicating this week may be too soon. A structural reform of his office is also expected in order to become more communicative and reflective of public opinion and work with the opposition in parliament. Regarding the possibility of the president meeting opposition leader Lee Jae-myung, the official indicated that all possibilities are open for communication with the opposition. However, as the ruling party's leadership has not been consolidated, the meeting would take at least the minimum amount of time for both sides to make it happen. Oh Seong, Arirang News. Shifting gears, Japan has renewed its false territorial claims to Korea's easternmost Dokdo Island in its diplomatic paper, sparking a strong backlash from Seoul. The report also said that it would not accept South Korea's ruling, ordering Japanese firms to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor. Choi Min-jung reports. 
Japan has yet again made territorial claims over Tokto Island in its annual foreign policy report. In its 2024 diplomatic blue book released on Tuesday, Tokyo renewed its false claim that Tokto is Japanese territory and stated that Seoul continued its illegal occupation of Tokto. It's a claim that has been repeatedly made in Japan's diplomatic blue book since 2018. South Korea responded with a strong protest against what it called Japan's repeated unfair territorial claims. The foreign ministry called for an immediate withdrawal of the claim. There is no territorial dispute over Dokto as it is clearly our territory historically, geographically, and under international law. Our government exercises firm territorial sovereignty over Dokto, and we will respond firmly and strictly to any unjust claims regarding Dokto. The ministry also summoned the deputy chief of mission at the Japanese embassy in Seoul. The Blue Book also disputed a South Korean Supreme Court ruling, which ordered Japanese firms to compensate South Korean victims of wartime forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. Despite repeated requests over the years, Japan has refused to make reparations to individuals, insisting all matters were settled under the 1965 treaty that normalized bilateral ties. In an attempt to mend relations with Japan, Seoul last year implemented plans to settle the issue of compensation through funds procured through a third party. We hope Japan will continue to make efforts to develop a future-oriented bilateral relationship while inheriting the historical awareness of Japan's past cabinets. Our government will continue to make efforts to help victims recover through the compensation plan. Meanwhile, the Blue Book describes South Korea as an important neighboring country that Japan should cooperate with as a partner. This reflects a significant improvement in bilateral ties since President Yoon suk yeol took office in 2022, as Tokyo last called Seoul a partner 14 years ago. Choi Min-dong, Arirang News. The top U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, visited the DMZ today. There, the U.S. ambassador said, just miles to the south, there is democracy and prosperity, and just miles to the north, repression and isolation. She said this is due to North Korea's escalatory rhetoric, misguided decision-making, and destabilizing actions that endanger the peace and security of the region. She added the U.S. remains open to dialogue without preconditions and urged the North to show up to the table in good faith. The top U.S. envoy to the U.N. has been visiting South Korea from Sunday till Wednesday. Geopolitical tensions in the Middle East and unfavorable weather conditions have driven up overseas oil prices with inbound shipments of some tropical fruits at record highs. This has led to a surge in imports for March, rising for three months in a row. Our Munerian has the details. High international oil prices and domestic fruit prices drove up South Korea's imports in March. Preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday show that the country's import price index rose 0.4 percent compared to the month before. It's the third month in a row that an on-month increase has been recorded. By category, raw materials, including mining products, saw the biggest hike, with oil import prices jumping by 4 percent from February. Crude oil prices have surged due to heightened tensions in the Middle East, rising to nearly 85 U.S. dollars a barrel in March and surpassing $90 earlier this month. A spokesperson from the central bank added that in light of the upward trend in oil prices, the import index for April could also see a rise. Recent data from the Korea Customs Service also show that fruit imports saw a large jump last month, with the total import value of pineapples and mangoes being the highest ever on record. Pineapple imports came to nearly 8.7 million U.S. dollars, while mango imports came to just over 24.7 million dollars. Orange and banana imports, too, saw a significant rise with a total value of inbound shipments for each reaching the highest level in nearly five years and three years, respectively. This comes as unfavorable weather conditions led to a surge in domestic fruit prices over the past few months, prompting the government to pledge reduced import tariffs on a record number of different types of fruit. Meanwhile, the country's exports saw an on-month climb of 0.4 percent in March, which is the third straight month that the country's export price index has risen. Chemical goods as well as computing and electronic goods drove up exports, with higher prices for memory chips contributing greatly to this upward tick. 
The BAK explained that semiconductor prices saw an on-month rise of 1.3% and an on-year rise of 18.9%. Moon Hye-ryeon, Arirang News. The South Korean won is falling against the U.S. dollar as geopolitical uncertainties in the Middle East continue and with lowered expectations for early interest rate cuts by the U.S. Central Bank. At the close of Tuesday's session, the $1 exchange rate hit 1394 after surpassing the $1,401 mark during the day for the first time in 17 months. This comes in light of the Federal Reserve's recent meeting notes that push back the likelihood of rate cuts this year and the recent conflict between Iran and Israel that has led to a strengthening greenback driven by increased safe haven demand. South Korea's central bank says they would be monitoring the foreign currency market closely. Today marks 10 years since the Sewar ferry sinking, one of South Korea's most painful maritime disasters that took the lives of hundreds of people, mostly schoolchildren. We take a closer look at how the victims are remembered on this day. Our Che soo tells the story. April 16, 2014. In the west coastal waters of Jindo, Jeollanam-do province in South Korea, the Sewol ferry accident took 304 people's lives. For the past 10 years, the families left behind have remained in deep sorrow, but they have been supporting each other to help overcome their pain. In 2021, the families created the Tanwan High School 4.16 memory classroom to preserve the records and mementos of the dead students. In this empty classroom, the dreams and futures of the 254 Tanwan High School students who made up most of the victims have been frozen for a decade. The government also acknowledged the national responsibility for the Sewol tragedy and recognized the value of the records in this space. The Korean Ministry of Interior and Safety has added the Tanon High School 4.16 Memorial Classroom to the National Archives of Korea in 2021, preserving it as a place of public memory. Asked the mother of Kim Do-hun, a second-year Class 3 student, one of the victims and the curator of the memory classroom said there are memoirs that should not be forgotten. The people of South Korea and everyone around the world vividly witnessed the Sewol tragedy happen on that day. This space is not just for memories of the disaster and the wounds it caused, but also a place for the future where we overcome pain and create hope. The day remains a deep wound in Koreans' hearts as well. Although I don't remember it well, I have visited here ever since the Sewol incident happened. I thought that such a thing should never happen again. The memorial ceremony was held in Ansan, Gyeonggi-do province on Tuesday, home to the Tanwon High School, which most of the victims attended, marking the 10th anniversary. Over 3,000 people attended the ceremony. The names of the 304 victims were called out one by one, including the five whose remains have yet to be recovered. At 4.16 p.m., a siren sounded to honor the victims and to remind people to be aware of potential disasters painful, but continuing to replay memories, this is how they heal their wounds and mourn their lost children. Che Soo-hyung, Arirang News, Ansan. In the Middle East, Iran is showing no signs of backing down as it promised a retaliatory action that will come in seconds if Israel strikes back. And this comes after Israel shared intentions to respond to Iran's attack over the past weekend. Our Lee Soo-jin tells us more. Tensions between Iran and Israel are continuing to escalate. According to the Iranian student news agency, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi said on Tuesday that Iran will meet the smallest action that goes against its interests with a severe, widespread and painful response. This comes just one day after Israel's war cabinet met to discuss how to respond to a direct attack from Iran against the country overnight on Saturday. 
a retaliation for the Israeli bombing of an Iranian embassy compound in Syria. During the meeting, the Israeli cabinet reportedly agreed on a strong response to make it clear that Israel does not tolerate Iran's recent attacks and that it deserves retaliation. We are considering our next steps and this launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones into Israeli territory will be met with a response. Israeli media outlet Channel 12 reported that Israel was weighing various retaliation options that are intended to be painful to Iran but would not cause an all-out war in a way that coordinates with allies, including the U.S. In response, Iran's deputy foreign minister said on Monday night that any such retaliation would warrant a response that would come in seconds. But if, for any reason, the Zionist regime wants to take even minor action against our land, it will definitely face a decisive and harsh response. And this answer will not take another 12 or 13 days. Zionists should not count in hours, but in seconds. Meanwhile, Israel's plans to launch a ground offense in Gaza's southern city of Rafa were paused as retaliatory plans against Iran's attacks have become the most important points of discussion for Israel. Lee Sujin, Arirang News. In New York, the jury selection process began Monday local time for former U.S. President Donald Trump's trial involving his alleged role in a hush money scheme before the 2016 U.S. presidential election. However, the court adjourned without picking any jurors due to concerns over impartiality. Our Yi shi brings us up to speed on the case. On Monday, Donald Trump became the first former U.S. president to face a criminal trial as jury selection began in New York involving his alleged role in a hush money payment scheme during the waiting days of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Trump is facing charges of falsifying business records to cover up a $130,000 U.S. dollars payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels to buy her silence about a 2006 sexual encounter Daniels said they had. The former president is pleading not guilty to all the charges and denying any such relationship with Daniels. This is blowing up as he strives for another shot at the White House as the presumptive Republican nominee for the presidential election in the fall. But on the first day of the historic trial, the court adjourned without selecting any jurors after the judge dismissed more than half of the 96 prospective candidates brought in because they said they did not think they could be fair and impartial. Justice Juan Merchant told them that they must set aside any biases or personal attitudes about the defendant or the case, including political orientation. The trial is scheduled to resume on Tuesday morning local time. Meanwhile, Trump railed against the judge before he entered the courtroom, calling the trial a scam. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. Outside the courthouse, Trump supporters and anti-Trump protesters fill the streets. And this is this is not the America I grew up in. It, it's frightening and it's horrible. And people are not speaking out. We individually and collectively are glad to see that Trump is finally being brought in front of a judge in a criminal case. Falsifying business records in New York is a felony punishable by up to four years in prison, although many found guilty previously have been sentenced to fines or probation. This is one of four criminal prosecutions Trump faces and the only one guaranteed to go to trial before the November 5th election. Lee shi Arirang News. A Korean research team has developed a patch that serves to repair severed nerves in a relatively simple manner. Our Chung Eun-ju explains. When a nerve in the body is severed in an accident, the two ends must be stitched together with a needle. Using thin threads with a diameter of one micrometer, even skilled microsurgery specialists take 15 to 20 minutes to stitch a single strand, making it a precise and challenging process. Although adhesives are being developed to connect severed nerves, there's still no method to mend them perfectly without suturing. 
Suturing with thread depends heavily on the skill of the surgeon, and foreign substances persisting around or inside the nerve can affect nerve regeneration. South Korean researchers have developed a patch that, when wrapped around like a bandage, securely connects the detached parts. The patch combines a soft polymer and a hydrogel with excellent adhesive properties to connect severed nerves smoothly. The research team used a hydrogel made of natural ingredients on the innermost layer of the triple-layered polymer, which upon contact with the nerve reacts with moisture to produce a strong adhesive force. An elastic polymer was used on the outer layer to replicate the physical properties of real nerves. The patch breaks down into small pieces after the nerves recover and does not affect the body because it is made of biocompatible material. When applied to severed nerves in mice, the area that used to take about 10 minutes to suture with a needle was found to be firmly connected in just one minute. Regardless of who performs the procedure, surgery can be performed easily, simply and uniformly. We expect a good prognosis as surgery time reduction is significant. The research team plans to conduct further studies to apply this patch not only to nerves but also to blood vessels and tendons. Jung Eun Ju, Arirang News. As yellow dust flowed in behind the rain clouds, air quality gradually became murky. The concentration of fine dust in Seoul has soared to two to three times higher than the usual levels. A fine dust warning has been issued in Gangwon, the province, and air will continue to be murky in the central parts of the country. You should bring a protective mask for fine dust instead of an umbrella tomorrow. The weather will be generally sunny and warm, but air quality will stay at bad levels nationwide. It is recommended that those with respiratory diseases refrain from going outside. Yellow dust is expected until the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow's Seoul and Daegu will start off at 10 degrees Celsius. Highs in Seoul will be topping out at 23, Busan 22 degrees. The warm spring weather will continue for the time being, but the effects of yellow dust will stay until Thursday. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. Well, that is all for this newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at 10 p.m. with the AI Headline News. Good night.